Good morning. I hope the lesson this morning will be a bit of a reality check for you. We're going to talk about some things that I think Christians take for granted at times. The reality of heaven, and I'm also going to talk about the reality of hell, uh, the afterlife in general. Do you really believe in heaven? Do you really believe in hell? That's going to be the ultimate destination for all of mankind, one of those two places. That's a universal reality that we find in the Bible. And so the question I want you to really think about this morning is, do you really believe in heaven or hell? I, I'm afraid that many Christians merely pay lip service to this belief, but they don't really, really believe in heaven or hell. They believe in part of it. What I mean is that people will sometimes kind of take the teeth out of hell, that, well, nobody's really going to go there. Yeah, it's real, but really just the devil and maybe the 1% worst of the worst in the world will be there, but nobody's really going to go there, or they say things like, it's, it's only temporary. Hell, hell's not permanent. It's only temporary. Or regarding heaven, they say everybody's going to go to heaven. Even, in, even the atheist, as long as he does good things, as long as he's a good person, everybody's going to heaven. And so without really considering the fact that what we do in life matters, how we live determines whether or not we'll be in heaven. So people, they, they pay lip service to these ideas, this idea of heaven and hell as the ultimate destination of all mankind. But again, are you willing to bet your life on the outcome of your life? Are you willing to bet your life now that what God has promised, whether prize or punishment, is true? And so that's the question for you to think about this morning. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at what the Bible actually teaches about heaven and hell as a good starting place. Uh, and, and so we consider, first of all, if you go to Matthew 25, Let's see what the Bible has to say, and uh, a good majority of what we're going to be looking at this morning about hell especially comes from the Gospels. In particular, you'll notice the words in red. Many people suggest that hell is not consistent with the character of, of God, uh, the, at least the idea of an eternal abode of the wicked or an eternal place of, of torment. They say that's not consistent with the character or nature of God, yet it is primarily Jesus above all others in the New Testament. It is primarily the words in red that we find any information about hell in the first place. One thing I want to point out is I believe they are equal and opposite of one another. Matthew 25 and verse 46, that is perhaps as equally good and unimaginably beautiful, heaven is. Maybe hell is equally bad and such an unimaginably terrible place to be. But I also want to suggest to you that they are equally an opposite uh, of another in the sense that they're both equally eternal. In Matthew 25 and verse 46, we know the greater context of Matthew 25 that uh, there's going to be a great day where the shepherd comes and will separate sheep from goat. That those on the right are the sheep who, who did the things they were supposed to do, who showed the love of God that they were supposed to show in their lives. Those on the left are the, the wicked and selfish ones. And they have two different destinations. Now notice how Matthew 25 and verse 46, that it's spoken of in the same breath. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I find there that there are equally eternal outcomes. It's spoken in the same breath. One group will go to eternal <laughs> eternal death it says eternal punishment will the righteous into eternal life again spoken in the same breath they are equally eternal and permanent similarly if you go to revelation chapter 14 we're going to look at verse 10 revelation chapter 14 and notice verse 10 first of all revelation 14 verse 10 it's regarding those who worship the beast in his image. I believe that means Satan. They receive a mark on their forehead, and it says in verse 10, but, all, but he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
Now, I'll stop right there for just a moment. I know this is not a pretty picture to imagine, but for those, again, who would argue that the teaching that hell is an eternal place of punishment is not consistent with the character and nature of God, I would point out to them, again, that at the end of verse 10, it says, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. It doesn't mean that the Lamb representing Jesus, it doesn't mean that he relishes or enjoys this display, but I think that indicates his entire holy approval at this judgment, that he will look on it and know that this is a just punishment. But in verse 11, it says, The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Again, this sounds as equally eternal as heaven is. Hell sounds to be an equally eternal punishment as well. So they are equal in the sense that they are both eternal but opposite in their natures. And so let's describe each a little bit. And the primary word that we find in the New Testament uh, in the Greek language is Gehenna. And, you know, through some various, you know, chain of transliterations, this originally started out as the Hebrew word for the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, and a lot of wicked things happen there. Uh, for example, in Second Chronicles chapter 28, uh, in the first couple of verses, you can read about King Ahaz, that they offered up, uh, as was according to the custom of the worship of Molech, they offered their children as sacrifices in the flames. It's needless to say that this horrified God, that this greatly displeased him, that this was really what signaled the end, that Judah lasted for a they lasted for a while longer than the northern ten tribes, but this is really, this type of behavior is what ultimately sealed their fate. It didn't matter that Josiah came along and, and did a little good to turn them around, but really, this was detestable, horrible in the sight of God. This is something that was associated, this place, the Valley of Hinnom, it was associated with a place of doing abominable things like putting children in the flames of fire. And so you can see how in Jewish custom and tradition that this place became synonymous with suffering and abomination and horrible things and fire as well. Because later on by Jeremiah 31, and I think even beyond the time of Jeremiah, that this place also became, well, synonymous with fire. This is where Jerusalem would exit the gates. This is where people would exit the gates of Jerusalem and throw their refuse their garbage, even dead bodies at times of war, as a constant furnace, a burning place of garbage. You didn't want to be there. Now, I've been up by the dump, you know, the Davis County landfill. In fact, we had a, there's a nice park right around the corner from it where we had a gathering, uh, you know, during our, our uh, in-house lectureship. We had a little social gathering there, and uh, it was a great park, but every now and then the wind would shift, and you know, I thought to myself, that garbage isn't even on fire, and it's pretty terrible. This was just not a great place. So you can imagine how this became their concept, and the word that was a, 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 um, eventually is the word I'm looking for, eventually is the word that became synonymous with the fires of hell. It was a place of burning refuse, of abomination, pain, suffering. This is where the word hell, as we know it, is derived from. Hell is also described, by no surprise, as a place that burns with constant fire. In Revelation chapter 20, and again, we have to keep in mind the highly figurative nature of Revelation, and also the fact that I think whether it's heaven or hell, when we talk about the afterlife, it's a spiritual existence. I think it's something that defies description. So the descriptions we have, I think we have to imagine that they come up short. And that should terrify us because the thought of eternal fire sounds bad enough. But I think it really comes up short of the reality of what it's going to be. In Revelation chapter 20, uh, notice in verse 10, it talks about the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. A little bit later on in this chapter, we notice the last two verses. Verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake 
of fire. Revelation 21 and verse 8 talks about that as, as a, a destination also for, it, it says, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, uh, and in the Gospels, again, we go back to the words in red. Jesus describes it in numerous places as a, uh, where people are weeping, moaning, gnashing their teeth. Matthew 13 and verse 50, for example. Again, this is meant to paint a horrifying picture, that this is supposed to be something that we read about and, and just cringe at the thought of being somewhere like this. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 50, it says, And we'll cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, in numerous places it's explained as weeping and gnashing of teeth, but I like this one because it also uh, incorporates our earlier examples of perpetual fire. And so that's how the Bible describes one possible outcome of eternity. Terrifying, horrible, a place of sorrow, a place where there is no hope, a place where there is no light, a place where there is no God, a place where there is only torment, misery, fire, suffering. And I believe, again, it's described as something that is eternal. On the other side, we have a place that is perfect, that is beautiful, beyond imagination. In Revelation 21, if you notice starting in verse 3, Revelation 21 and verse 3, it's, it's a place of absolute fulfillment, satisfaction, meaning, purpose, true joy, and it is devoid of suffering. Revelation 21 and verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. I believe it was a week ago in my lesson that I talked about how Paul, in writing to the Philippians, said, I want to stay here because there's great work for me to do. There is work on your behalf. I want to stay and help you and do work in the kingdom of God, but I also... I'm ready to die, Paul said, and his simple words were because I'm ready to depart and be with Christ because that is very much better. That simple description of heaven is what we find here in Revelation 21 and verse 3. Heaven is heaven because God is there. And that's what it says. He shall be with his people and God himself shall be among them. Verse 4 of Revelation 21, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, signifying comfort. And there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. It's a very beautiful place. 1 Peter chapter 1. I love the thought in 1 Peter chapter 1 because I hear people say, I don't think I want to go to heaven because it's going to be like sitting in church for eternity. First of all, I like sitting in church. But second of all, we're, we're promised that it's not going to lose its splendor. That after the first, you know, after the first million years, we're not going to be tired of it. We're still going to be equally excited for the next million years. And I know time will have no meaning there. So I'm just using that as a figure. But in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, it says that we obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. You know, think like a, like a Twinkie, indefinite shelf life, never goes bad. <laughs> imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. It won't lose its luster. Its glory will never fade away. When we've been there 10,000 years, we'll be rejoicing for 10,000 years more. It's, it's never going to lose its glory. It's never going to lose its beauty. It's never going to fade. It's always going to be wonderful. So don't worry about that. God promised it's going to be great. And that's one thing we know about reading the Bible. God keeps his promises. And so here's just a little, just a little fraction of what the Bible says, but I just wanted to make it, paint it in very clear strokes. Heaven and hell are equally eternal, and there's only one of two destinations for all of mankind. This truth is universally applied to all of mankind that has ever lived or ever will live. There's only one of two places, and both options are eternal. Hell is described as a place of suffering, 
weeping, mourning, sorrow, fire. Heaven is described as being in the very presence of God, beautiful, and having a glory that will never fade away. So in the simplest terms, without spending too much more time, that's, that's what the Bible, in simple terms, teaches about heaven and hell. So again, as, as we bring, back, bring it back around to the question we started this lesson with, do you really believe in heaven? Do you really believe in heaven? Do you really believe in hell? Because my premise in this lesson is very simple. I believe that if you truly believe in heaven and hell, that will have an impact on the way you live your life. It should affect the decisions you make. It should affect your choices in life if you really believe. If you do more than just pay lip service to this concept, if you truly believe in it, it should change the way you live and behave in this life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1, it's funny, this is really where the lesson started, is just me thinking about Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 1. And as you see on the pictures, uh, that, I, I went to pick up Navy's birth certificate last month, now that she's a year old. Um, but I got it, so it's, it's taken care of, you know. Uh, when a man says he'll get a job done, he will. You don't have to bother him every six months to do it. He'll get it done. But I saw this these words on the wall, and it just something about that seemed very profound to me, that your birth and death certificates right there next to each other, that there's something about life that, you know, those are man's two great days, that the day we come into this world and the day we leave, and we often see in an obituary, we've got, say, 1931-2018. That dash represents the entire life. <laughs> but sandwiched between those two points. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. I know I'm taking this verse out of context a little bit, but this is really what got me thinking about this. Do you really believe that? Do you really live as if the day I die, that's going to be the real important day? I mean, we celebrate our birthdays every year, and people are, are afraid to think about death. They, don't want, they, they just want to put that out of their mind. I think most people look at this as being opposite of the truth, that the day of death is better than the day of birth. We think, no, the day of birth is better because you're at the beginning of life. You've got your whole life ahead of you. But for the Christian, we really should look at the day of our death as the day when life really begins, when eternity begins. If we have our hope in heaven, if we trust God and believe his promises, this should be truth to us. We should bet our entire life on this promise that what comes at the day of death is better. But what really matters, though, is how we spent that time in between these two dates because that will determine our eternity. Do you really believe this? Hell should frighten us. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And, you know, our, our motivation, it really should be more complex, but there's nothing wrong with this being a component of our motivation. We should be afraid of hell. Now, if that's our only reason we follow God because we're afraid of punishment, I think we're immature in our relationship with God. It needs to develop beyond this, but Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 the prospect of hell should terrify us. And again, that should change the way we live. Knowing and truly believing that this is one possible outcome at the end of our life for all eternity, this should change the way we live if we really believe this. And he says in Matthew 10 and verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This should terrify us. What I read about, about fire for all eternity, about weeping and gnashing of teeth, we should be scared of that. And that should cause us to live a certain way. We should live in a way where we, we say, I don't ever want to be there. And if God told us this is the way to avoid that, we should change our lives and do everything we can to live that way. And similarly, heaven should be a motivation for us. In Philippians chapter 3, 
Philippians chapter 3, this is the prize. Again, our relationship with God should be should develop beyond just fear of punishment and wanting a prize. But there's nothing wrong. I think we can all be honest and admit that all of us who are Christians here this morning, we should all be honest enough to admit we don't want to go to hell. We are afraid of that. That we do want heaven. Nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong with wanting those things or being afraid of hell. Now, that shouldn't be the whole of your motivation for serving God, but it certainly should be a part of it. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It is this idea of the prize at the end of life. And again, that's where the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. You think about a battle, a fight, a war, the day of victory, that last day, that's the best part. When it's over, because you get to enjoy the victory of the accomplishment. And that's the whole idea here is that we, we, want, we don't want to go to hell. And so we should live in a way where we, we aren't headed towards that. We should live in a way that takes us towards God because we want the prize. We hear the upward call of God leading us to our heavenly home forever. And so this should change the way we live. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. Now, in the verses leading up to this, it talks about how everything around you, everything you see, everything that is physical will be destroyed. It says in verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed, again, the 2 Peter 3, verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, that is through intense fire, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? And that's the question I really want you to think about. What sort of people ought you to be? If you truly believe that this world will cease to exist at some point, if you truly believe that what awaits us at the end of this life's journey is either hell or heaven for all eternity. What sort of people ought you to be? How should you live your life? Again, that's the basic premise I want to get across to you in the lesson this morning, is that truly believing this message should change the way you live. So that's where we want to bring this lesson to its conclusion, is just how do we apply this? If we are completely convicted of this reality of heaven and hell, it's a beyond a shadow of a doubt, absolute in our mind. Do you live like that? Do you live a life that is consistent with that belief? Someone who truly believes in God's teaching about heaven and hell, someone who truly believes in these realities, I think it's going to change the way they behave. For one thing, Someone who believes in heaven and hell truly believes they're going to do everything they can to save as many people as they can. In Luke chapter 16, we know the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And for all those books that are out there in, in recent years about someone dying and spending a few minutes in heaven and coming back to tell us all about how wonderful it is, I find it interesting that the one real story about someone who died and came back to tell us about it? Well, he didn't really come back, but it's, it's not about someone who died and went to heaven. That's, that's not how God chose to motivate us, send someone back and tell us all about heaven. He said, why don't you hear the testimony of someone who died and went to the other place? In Luke chapter 16, you can better believe his message was, you don't want to be here. Do everything you can to avoid this. And his thoughts immediately were turned to his brothers. He said, nobody, I don't want anybody to be here. This is terrible. He says in Luke chapter 16 and verse 27, Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 27, this is the rich man in torment. He says, uh, I beg you, Father, that you send him, that is Lazarus, who is in comfort, who is in paradise. He says, I beg you that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham's answer was, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. 
But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they listen or be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. But the point is, this rich man, he believes in the reality of hell because he's experiencing it. We shouldn't have to experience it for ourselves to know that it's terrible. It's what all of us went through as a kid. Don't touch the oven. You'll burn yourself. I had to touch the oven for myself and learn the hard way. I had to learn everything the hard way for that matter, but we shouldn't have to. Take it from this rich man. You don't want to be there. Nobody wants to be there, whether they know it or not. It's a terrible place. And that's what this man immediately thought of when he experienced it. I don't want anybody else to come here. I want to save my brothers. I want to help them avoid coming to this place. And so, again, sometimes we, we don't fully understand this concept. We just pay lip service to the idea of heaven and hell. We sometimes get, I'm afraid, caught up in, in selfishness. I'm going to heaven. I've obeyed the gospel. I'm good. But in the eyes of God, that's not enough. In Matthew 22, Jesus said the greatest command is to love God and love your neighbor. We love other people because God loves them. We can't just be satisfied with, well, I'm going to heaven, so I'm set. We have to look around the world and see people that are headed to a dark and sorrowful place of punishment and torment for all eternity. And we should be motivated. We should see them. We should see the, the pain that is coming their way. We should see the, the disaster that their life is headed towards. And we should be terrified for them. And we should be motivated to do whatever we can to help them. Just like this rich man. But for him, it was too late. And for his brothers, it was probably too late. If we really believe... We should want as many people to be in heaven with us as possible. We should want to do everything we can for everybody that we can to help them avoid that horrible place. So again, do you really believe in heaven and hell? What does your life say? What does your actions say about your convictions? Do they match up? Someone who really believes in heaven and hell will give until it hurts. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, what I'm talking about is just, do we really trust? Do we really trust God that something better awaits us? Or are we too afraid? Are we too selfish, too miserly in this life? Because we just don't trust God. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, for the rich people, he says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. And so again, that's the challenge for us is to really believe it, to really practice what we preach. Do I really believe that if I make sacrifices now that God says it will be worth it if you just trust me, if you give till it hurts, if you're generous, not selfish, if you don't fix your hope on worldly treasure, you're storing up treasure for the life to come. Do we really believe that promise? Because if we believe it, it will affect the way we share our possessions with others. I think we will be more generous. He goes on to say, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Do you keep everything you have to yourself? Because you're afraid if you're left with nothing, then you'll have nothing. Do you value this worldly treasure more than what God says is treasure in heaven? Life indeed. So again, the question I want you to ask is, if you really believe in this, does that belief, is that reflected in your behavior, in your actions? Someone who really believes in heaven and hell will avoid sin at all costs. Sin is no laughing matter. In Hebrews chapter 11, we need to see beyond the temporary. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, 
It says of Moses that by faith, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Here, Moses is a great example for us in faith. Moses really believed that something better was waiting for him at the end of life's journey. He really believed God. He put all of his hope. He banked on God. He bet his life on the promises of God. He said, I will give up everything, all this wealth and power in Egypt, because I think God has something better. It says he was looking to the reward. He could see beyond the temporary nature, the passing pleasures of sin, it says. And that's, that's the challenge for us today, that if we really believe in heaven and hell, if we really believe, and uh, go over to Revelation chapter 20 one more time. Revelation chapter 20. If we really believe in heaven and hell as the only two possible outcomes at the end of this life, we should avoid sin for all we can. We should do everything we can to seek out the mercy and grace of God and follow where he leads us. And do everything we can to forsake sin, to be dead to our old sinful life and live only for Christ. Because I tell you what, the choices we make in life have eternal ramifications. That's the standard by which we're going to be judged, by our deeds in life. Like I said, you have two dates, your birth and your death, and a little dash in between. That dash matters so much because it tells you what comes after your death. How you've lived your life will determine how you spend your eternity. In Revelation chapter 20, I want you to notice specifically verse 12. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. If you really believe in heaven and hell, you won't play around with sin. You won't dabble in sin. You will avoid it like the plague because you understand pursuing a life of sin will lead you to eternal death, eternal punishment. You understand that following the path that God has set before you leads you to an eternal reward. One other thought, if you really believe in heaven and hell, you shouldn't have any fear of death. In 1 Corinthians 15, and again, this is really all about, do you trust God? Do you have faith in his promises? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of, sin, of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Like Paul, we should want to stay here. We should see the good that we could do here and want to do as much of that as possible. We should be motivated to do everything we can to save others, to help others. That's what keeps us here. I want to be here for my daughter. I want to help her grow up and experience you know, get through the experiences and challenges of life. I want to be here for her. I want to be here for my brethren to help as many as I can. I want to be here for those who are lost in sin, my neighbors, the people I see on the streets that I walk by every day. But I shouldn't be afraid of death. Paul wanted to stay here to help others, but he also freely admitted, I very much want to go home. Paul wasn't afraid of death. If we understand the implications of heaven, if we understand what it means to be washed clean of our sins, if we believe in the power of the blood of Christ, we shouldn't fear death. There are many other things we could have put on this list, but I just want to share a few thoughts, and I really hope you'll be thinking about this in your own life. Do you really believe in this? Because it should affect the way you live. Does your choices, does your actions are they consistent with your convictions? 
We read in John chapter 3 and verse 16 last week that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. Again, we are both in faith and obedience to Christ, being washed by His blood and following where He leads us. We are both saved from a punishment, a terrible fate, and we are given a hope of something great and wonderful. Heaven is our motivation. We're told indirectly in Revelation 2 and verse 10 to be faithful until the point of death because God says, I will give you the crown of life. Heaven will be worth it all. If you really believe that, you will give up anything. You will make whatever sacrifice Jesus asks of you to make. You will take up the cross that he asks you to take up gladly because you know he keeps his promises. So I want to invite you this morning, if you've heard about hell, and maybe you fear that's the direction you're headed in life, if you've heard about heaven, you want the confidence that comes by being washed by the blood of the Lamb, having your sins forgiven. We want to make that possible. We want to help you in that journey. And we invite you to come forward and make that need known right now as we stand and sing. Have you been?